I want to talk to you about gifts of the desert. When I was a child, I used to hear preachers talk about the wilderness, and I would get a picture in my mind of uh, a forest. And that's because the Appalachians are covered with dense vegetation, and they're filled with all kinds of wildlife. Scientists say that after the last ice age, every life form now in North America came from the Appalachians, which makes our mountains something like the continent's mother. They're wild, they're mysterious, and they're, they're wonderful. And that's what we have in mind when we sing the lyrics to America the Beautiful, when we sing about the pilgrims who made a home in the wilderness. But that's not the right picture of what the Bible calls the wilderness. When the Bible speaks of the word wilderness... It literally means the wild place, the place beyond safety and comforts of civilized life. And for much of the Middle East, that means the desert. The word desert in both Greek and Latin make this clear. In Greek, the word uh, for desert is eremo, and it's connected to our word for hermit. In Latin, the word is solitaribus, and it's, uh, that's connected to our word solitary. The English word for desert also has this sense when we use it as a verb about someone deserting someone else. It means to leave them alone. So in the Bible, the desert is a wild place. It's a wilderness. It's a place where one is alone and unplugged from the benefits and security of human structures and cast out on the mercy of capricious nature. It's not a place where human beings normally want to live. It's not even the place where most of us want to visit for any length of time. But just as our Appalachian wilderness rebirthed this continent, the Bible describes the wilderness as a place of personal and communal rebirth. It's a place of unmaking, but it's also a place of remaking, a place for clearing out old things and making room for new things. And so the prophet writes, Behold, a voice is crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And depending on the way we punctuate the sentence, because ancient language didn't have punctuation, it can either mean that the voice in the wilderness is telling us to prepare for the Lord's coming, or it can mean the voice is instructing us that in the wilderness is the place we should go to order in order to meet God. The gospel writers draw on both meanings in describing the ministry of John the Baptist, who was that voice in the wilderness preparing God's way, and he's also calling believers into the wilderness that they can prepare the way. And then as Jesus begins his ministry, St. Luke says that the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. That is to say, he drove him out into the desert to be tempted by the devil. At first glance, that seems terribly cruel, but the Bible insists that a person's growth as well as his knowledge of God often develops in times of difficulty and loneliness and even temptation. And therefore, the Spirit often pushes us into places we do not wish to go. Because the health of our soul depends on the things we discover in the desert. When I was a child, our songs often dwelled on this theme, and it made our faith feel at times dark and depressing. Nonetheless, there's a book of lamentations in the Bible. Have you ever seen it? And it is there because it expresses things that need to be expressed. And we've got to, at some point, realize that the symbol of Christianity is a cross and not a smiley face. The desert is an essential part of an authentic spiritual life. And I will go even further to say that our contemporary insistence that sermons and songs ought to always be upbeat and optimistic perverts and it impoverishes the gospel. When we exclude prayers and sermons and songs that deal with difficult things, what we're saying in effect is that, God, uh, that life in God should be substantially free of troubles and trials. That is a lie. It sets us up for great disillusionment and even for bitterness. The fact of the matter is our faith is filled with unanswered questions and heartbreaking pain and unresolved issues, and nonetheless, it's filled with joy unspeakable and is full of glory. The cross is the center of our faith, and that makes death an ever-present reality in an authentic spiritual life. And by that, I don't mean merely death as the end of mortal life. I mean death as a symbol of how all kinds of things, things like enjoyable seasons of life, friendships, favorable circumstances, reputation, kinds of things we wish would go on forever and ever, but which cannot and will not because they're not eternal. These sorts of things die, and when they do, we experience great pain. The part of our faith that allows us to acknowledge human mortality, though, 
also leads us to expect newness of life. The end of things makes way for the beginning of things. And if we cling too tightly to old things, we try to preserve old seasons that are over, relationships that have ended, reputations that have not been based on reality. What was once blessed and fruitful becomes putrid and corrupt. That's why from time to time we need a desert. The desert represents that part of spiritual reality. It's a place of scarcity and loneliness and fear and uncertainty and potential disaster. When you're in the desert, you're out of control. You, you, you can die within a few hours if you don't find water. You can become disoriented be, uh, under the, the never-ending light of the sun. The ground underneath you is filled with uh, serpents and scorpions, and you, they can strike you without warning. And we are to believe that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, drove our Lord into just such a place, that the Spirit pushed our Savior into this hellish environment on purpose, that he might be tempted by the devil. And furthermore, we're to believe that the Spirit may lead us there from, as well for the same reasons. And when that occurs in our life, we enter the desert. And that's when our Sunday school country club religion filled with its sweet and childish cliches gets smashed into pieces. Out here in the desert, wild nature quickly chokes out all the religious formulas and the pat answers that we quote from our, and sing and, and, and preach. And the desert... Uh, uh, forces us to confront the mystery, the abyss of human ignorance, and the limits of human ability. In the desert, we're undone. We're undone both as individuals and as groups, and we either find our life in God or we lose our life clinging to self. First week I was in Phoenix, one of the elders of the church wanted to see me, and I went to his home. He was on his deathbed. He was running out of time. In fact, his would be the first uh, funeral that I preached there. H. Miller was a dignified man. He, was, he had known wealth and national influence. He counted among his friends uh, 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 in the who's who of American political life. And, and sick as he was, he exclu excluded or uh, exuded this sort of presence that a person like that often carries. And he said, I had to give you a message before you begin your pastorate. I'm very sick and I don't have much time. He said, first, you need to know this is going to be a difficult place for you. Our church has many problems, and your assignment won't be easy. And there's another reason besides that. This is the desert, and our desert can kill people. I spent years here, he said, trying to find a way out. I thought of this desert as ugly, nothing like the lush landscape of Tennessee where you're from. And then I took a trip to the Holy Land. He said, I kept trying to get out of here. And I took a trip to the Holy Land, and I discovered it was much like Arizona. And I was there in Israel for a few days, and he said, I began to pray, asking God why he had chosen such a difficult environment for the people he loved. And it dawned on me. A lush environment calls attention to itself. A harsh environment encourages one to look beyond the natural world into a different level of reality. And my advice to you, he said, is walk the desert. Make peace with it. Try to figure out why God placed you here. There'll be times in your life it feels like punishment, but it's not. In fact, he said he placed Abraham, Moses, and Jesus in a place much like this. Find out why God placed you here, and you're going to meet God in a different way. Well, while I was in Arizona, there was many times that I recalled H. Miller's words, and I, I tried my best to press to, to that place where I would make the desert my home. And I never quite did that in the physical realm, but... I learned many things about God in the desert. For example, I found out that what we think about as being our own faith is usually groupthink. It's stuff we've accepted and which we may even fiercely defend, but it's not really ours. Before going to the desert, you see, when you're confronted with a difficult question, you open your mouth and repeat old, tired formulas that we've heard in our churches and songs and sermons and when we're in a lush place and surrounded by believers that are enjoying prosperous times, those kinds of cliches will bring tears to our eyes. We repeat them one to another, so we think we're really addressing reality. But you get into an addiction that won't budge. You get into a sickness that won't heal. You, you start talking with intelligent unbelievers who are asking reasonable questions. Things you'd rather not think about and if your only response then is to speak louder or retreat into the company of the already convinced, you're going to discover in the desert that none of that stuff works, and you're going to discard it rather quickly, and you're going to become disoriented. 
A lot of that kind of thing got removed from my life in Arizona. The believers out there tend to tolerate a wider spectrum of opinions within the church because they're surrounded by a culture that doesn't think much of the church. New Agers and Libertarians and Humanists, they outnumber Christians, and they don't mind pointing out what are the inconsistencies in our arguments and our behaviors. While in Arizona, for example, I discover that New Age types are pretty kind and intelligent people most of the time. They're not at all like I had ignorantly described them in this very pulpit, in this very church, to the applause of everybody, which I was very happy for. <laughs> Out in the desert, I discovered that other religions exist because their teachings and practices bring comfort and community to the people who follow them. And that means that ridicule and attack are not healthy Christian responses to people's beliefs or practices. What we need and what they need are real answers, which are based on listening to what people believe, other people believe. If, I'd al- if I had always stayed where people, things were spiritually lush, I wouldn't have discovered that. I would have remained naive and simplistic and isolated from the rest of the world. To honestly converse with unbelievers as opposed to kind of beating them down with Bible passages, I had to open my heart and mind, and I had to listen respectfully to people's opinions and questions and acknowledge when their words were making me think. How could I expect them to listen to me with an open mind if I was obviously not interested in their story? But as I opened my heart and mind, I entered the desert of uncertainty. How could I be certain that I was right in, in the presence of all of these kind and intelligent people who believe things so differently than me? See, when one lives continually in the lush valley of unquestioned belief, he's content with his own level of knowledge and faith, and he eats of the fruit of the land, and he grows fat with self-satisfaction because he's protected from other ways of looking at the world. If he meets an intelligent and a kind Buddhist, or an atheist for that matter, and especially if he's experienced pain from the hands of brutal Christians who are so certain of their own righteousness and correct doctrine, He will find himself dazed by the heat and the light of new knowledge, and he's walking without shade, and he can easily lose his way. That happened to me in Arizona. Can it really be God who purposefully leads a person into such a spiritually difficult place? Yes. The Spirit drove Jesus into the desert precisely in order to expose him to this kind of temptation, this kind of unraveling of the soul. Unraveling of one's security and sense of safety in the world. Dottie Rambo captures the reasons why God does this in one of her songs. When I'm low in spirit, I cry, Lord, lift me up. I want to go higher with thee. But he knows I can't live on a mountain, so he picks out a valley for me. He leads me beside the still waters and somewhere in the valley below, he draws me aside to be tempted and tried, but in the valley. He restoreth my soul. God will lead us into places where it feels like we're coming apart. But he does it to remove the hindrances to learning new things and accepting new callings that we never will if we are in our uh, accustomed environment, in a custom place in life. Today's passage from Isaiah suggests that God leads not only individuals but groups of individuals into the desert. Nations that have enjoyed wealth or power for long periods of time tend to feel entitled to those things and believe the wealth and power are signs of their special relationship with God. When the economy and power go south, the folks that have enjoyed those things usually look to others to blame for their change of status. But what if the blame is to be placed on God himself? What if it's God that purposefully leads a nation into the desert in order to restore its soul? And what about churches? When churches are full of people and money, we tend to believe those things that that, that the church is spiritually healthy. But is that true? In my experience, the money and the crowds soon become self-justifying. And we will do anything, even ignore injustice and sin, in order to keep the noses and the nickels pouring in. Don't get me wrong, I prefer seasons of prosperity to seasons of trial. But can we be certain it's not God that leads a church into a desert place? And isn't in the desert place where our attention goes back on God? And don't we begin to get serious about our life and our faith and how we're treating others when difficulty finally destroys our ability to keep up our appearances? 
When we stop wishing we were back in the lush environment we once enjoyed, we may begin to notice the beauty of the desert. The desert flowers are brief and they're small, but they're stunningly beautiful. And once we get accustomed to it, we'll notice the desert actually teems with life. Listen, once you acknowledge your addiction, you will discover who your friends are. And once you talk about your spiritual struggles, the people who share your struggles will come forward to pray with you and to love you, and God will use your spiritual quest to liberate you from your false friends. You'll no longer have to keep up the facade to please people. You can become who you are. You can say what you really believe. You can be who you really are. You can practice your faith the way you wish because the desert has stripped away your fear of others and, you, and, and the desert will teach you to survive if you must with all the trappings, without all the trappings and amenities of a lush life. After the desert, you will prefer freedom to bondage even if your freedom requires simplicity of life and a smaller circle of friends. You'll quit managing everything to keep everybody away so they won't know what you're, really about, what you're really struggling about and all that kind of stuff. You'll give all that up after the desert because you don't care anymore. It's a great place to be. It's called freedom. It's a song today that Sean said, sang says, Tell me, how do you handle the guilt of your past? How do you deal with the shame? How can you smile when your heart is broken and filled with pain? And tell me, what do you give when you've given your all and it seems like you can't make it through? And then he answers, you must stand. When there's nothing left to do, you stand. You don't give up. Through the storm, through the rain, through the hurt, through the pain. Don't bow. Don't bend. Hold on. Be strong. God will step in and it won't be long. After you've done all you can, after you've gone through all the hurt, after you've gone through all the pain, you've gone through the storm and you've gone through the rain, prayed and cried and prayed and cried and prayed and cried and prayed and cried. After you've done all you know to do, you just stand. The desert teaches you to do that. The desert teaches you that most of the things you fear are not nearly as bad. You can't endure as that great philosopher and prophet Dolly Parton says, a broken heart won't really kill you. It just feels like that for a while. And then you come out on the other side. You don't know that till you go to the desert and you get it all stripped away. You know you can live with a lot less than you thought you had to live with. You can live with a lot less friends than you thought you had. You can live with a lot less of people thinking well of you. You can live with people not thinking well of you. You know who you are before God. You can just stand. You can just stand. You can just stand. People can, can, can run away from you. You can just stand. People can say things about you. You just stand. Not because you're arrogant. Not because it doesn't hurt. Not because you're not sad. But because you know in whom you have believed. You know who you are in Jesus Christ. And the fact is you can live with little or with much. Like Paul says I've learned to be content in want. I've learn to be content and abounding. And if you learn to be content and want or in abounding, it really doesn't matter which one it is. Life is short here anyway. You just be who you are. You do what you're supposed to do. And you let the world adjust to you. Thanks. Some just heard it thunder. Today's passage was a promise of God's people in exile that things would not always be as they were. God told them to strengthen one another. Remember, the desert will not always be harsh and bare. The Lord will come and save us. Water will burst forth and streams will flow. The eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The thirsty ground will become a pool. And God will make a way in the desert, a road in the desert called the highway of holiness. And even if you think of yourself as a fool, don't worry about it. You won't miss out on God's blessing if you're looking for him because even the fool don't get lost on this road. And the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. I think those words were in the Lord's mind when he found himself looking face to face, eye to eye with the great tempter, the great deceiver. And as he struggled with thirst and his hunger for a good reputation and even for his desire for a saintly life, the devil offered shortcuts and easy paths. But with each temptation, Jesus countered with the word, it is written, it is written, it is written. No choirs, no pianos, no music, no church building, just the sheer word of God in the desert. It's enough. Is there any wonder then that Jesus left the desert in the power of the Spirit? 
Is it any wonder he walked into the synagogue and put evil to flight immediately after that? Jesus had discovered the gifts of the desert and he used them to overcome the power of the devil in his own life and in the life of others. Listen, the way to authentic holiness, an authentic power with God, and even authentic personhood is to follow the Lord when he calls you into the desert and receive the gifts it offers. The most important of these gifts is the gift of salvation itself. When we come to that point, we realize our lives are empty, that we have no meaning, our future is not going anywhere. We can look beyond the bareness of our souls and discover the presence of the living God. There's a burning bush out in that desert, and it tells us from that burning bush, that voice tells us to take off our shoes, which means we've got to expose ourselves even more, the vulnerability to that desert. But the voice will speak, will tell us that the one who made us is looking for us and has called us into this desert so we will prepare the way of the Lord and make straight his paths. Having accepted the gifts of the desert, then we leave the desert in the power of the Spirit like Jesus did. That's what can happen to you. You may be in the desert. You may be going into a desert. You may have had deserts in your life. There were gifts there. I hope you picked them up. If you didn't, you still can. You go back and you realize what the desert taught you. One of the great things it will teach you is that You don't have to fear anything except the loss of your own soul. There is nothing else to fear. Soon I will be done with troubles and trials. Soon I will be done with troubles and trials. Soon I will be done with troubles and trials Cause I'm going home to be with God So no more weeping and wailing No more Weeping and wailing no more. Weeping and wailing. I'm going home to be with God. I said no more. Weeping and wailing no more. Weeping and wailing no more. Weeping and wailing. We're going home. To be with God Soon we're going to be done With troubles and trials Soon we're going to be done With troubles and trials Soon we're going to be done With these troubles and these trials We're going home To be with God What's that do to us? We say So no more Of this weeping and wailing No more weeping and wailing now. No more weeping and wailing. We're going home to be with God. Anybody need strengthened right now? You're on your path and you're in the middle of the desert and you'd like a God to touch you and lift you up and give you some springs in the desert. Why don't you come down here and join me right now? No more weeping. Weeping and wailing no more. Weeping and wailing. We're going home, home to be with God. No more we'll be begun done with the troubles of this world. The troubles of this world. Troubles of this world. Soon I will be done with the trouble of this world Going home to live with God I wonder if some of you just come and stand behind them right now Weeping and wailing no no more Weeping and wailing no more Weeping and wailing going home to live with God Amen. Why don't you stand? Soon we'll be 
done. Soon I will be done with the trouble of this world. Going home to live with God. You know, when you know that, it makes this present life filled with light and joy. When you know that God has your eternal soul in the palm of his hand, whether you're on the mountaintop or you're in the valley or in you're in the desert, you know in whom you have believed and who you are and everything is okay. I, I, think, I think for the benediction today, I, I, I wanna go back and uh, I wanna give you this message. Sean will help me because I've destroyed my throat yelling. Uh, but I want you to hear this message and hear it really, really in the profound part of your heart. Because if you can accept it, you can leave here today, whether you're right now in a prosperity time or you're in a difficult time, you can know that God is there with you. And if you know that, everything is okay. And as we come through the desert, you're able to say something like this. So I thank God for the mountain and I thank him for the valley and I thank him for the trials he brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I'd never learn how God could solve them. And I never know what faith in his word can do. Oh, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust him. I've learned yeah, yeah, to yeah. trust in God. I'm a mind of through it all. Depend upon his word. Oh, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. On his word. Well, it's time to go so you can go out there and drive through the storm. Be careful when you drive. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock. Those of you interested in work and community stuff, these are wonderful, blessed meetings. We meet in Carson Hall over here. But I think I want to sing the verse one more time so you really hear it in your ears. I, I want to... I, I want to be like the advertisers and get something that you can't get out of your head that just makes you mad all through the week because it just like sticks in there and it won't get out. I thank God for the mountain. I've been there. And I thank him for the valley. And I got to thank him for all the storms that he brought me through. If I never had those problems, I would have never learned how God can solve them. And I never know, never know, never know, never know what faith in God's word can do. That's why I'm saying. Have a wonderful week. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God.